Okay, we now come to the next part of our course. The next part of our course deals with noise. We look at the performance of the various communication systems that we have seen, the various modulation schemes that we have studied, namely various uh, variations of amplitude modulation and the frequency and phase modulation uh, and try to understand uh, how do they behave in the presence of noise. As you know noise is one of the major uh, limiting factors in the performance of communication systems. Now what is this noise that we talk about? Uh, how do we characterize it? We, we already seen some of that in our introductory remarks about the course at the very beginning of the course. We said that noise is generated by every physical component that you might use in the transmitter and the receiver, every electronic component, right. So uh, every electronic component therefore is a source of noise. The transmission medium through which the information passes is a source of noise. Uh, and in a very rough sense noise is some random waveform, right. Now when, when you are dealing with random waveforms, first of all we need to understand what are the so called random waveforms. How do we mathematically characterize them? Because unless we have a mathematical model and characterization for these waveforms, you cannot possibly do a, an analytical or theoretical study of the performance of communication systems in the presence of noise, okay. So um, in a, that's that is the next part of our course that we are going to deal with for at least a few uh, weeks. Now um, when we want to characterize noise, we need basically need to deal with random phenomena and the, and the mathematical discipline which deals with random phenomena is the discipline of probability theory, random variables and random processes. In view of the fact that the class has a varied background, uh, I will go through a very quick brief brush up with probability theory and random variables and then proceed on to random processes as it is relevant for our discussion, okay. So it will take a uh, while, uh, while we go through that and we will start the process immediately. Okay. So to start with, let me define some basic things, oh there is a problem here, I think I will have to probably my because of the transparencies I do not think we are getting a good image, okay I will do something about it next time, Let, right now I will write, does not matter. Okay, We will start with the concept of a random experiment which is our starting point. A random experiment is any experiment or any uh, phenomenon that we look at whose outcomes are unpredictable and therefore are random, right. So basically a random pro, uh, experiment is characterized by random outcomes, Ran, by random I mean unpredictable, okay. And every outcome that you can possibly have as a, um, when, we, when we perform the experiment um, in a formal sense we define it as a sample point. So a sample point is any possible outcome of a random experiment. I am just giving you a quick, a quick uh, definition of various things and then uh, going ahead, right. Now a collection of all possible sample points that the random experiment can produce, that is a collection of all possible outcomes that it, that it can produce, we call it a sample space. So a sample space omega is uh, you can say the set of all possible outcomes. <coughs> so if the outcomes are denoted by S1, S2, S sub n, right, let us say it has a finite number of outcomes, then this set, this aggregation of all possible outcomes constitutes the sample space and each of these individual points is called a sample point. I will not give too many examples because most of you are familiar with these things. For example, when you um, uh, uh, toss a coin, the two possible outcomes that you can have are heads and tails. So the number n there is 2, right, 
and the sample points consist of H and T, the head uh, occurrence of a head or occurrence of a tail. Next we define the concept of an event. An event is either a single sample point or a set of sample points, right. Basically in a more general sense a subset of the sample space is an event formally, right. So a subset of the sample space and there can be very many subsets of a sample space these are called events. For example uh, again um, tossing a coin we could the event could be um, head or tail occurs right. It is uh, this is a now this is a complete sample space either head or tail will occur right but we define it as an event neither head nor tail occurs right when you toss a coin it is an impossible event one of the two will occur right. So when we talk of um, various logical combinations of the events uh, of the basic outcomes right or the sample points we, cons we construct events. So if you have n sample points in a sample space the number of possible events that you can talk about is 2 to the power n the power set of s right the power set of omega. So there is uh, let me uh, take an example here suppose we talk about throwing a dice there are six possible outcomes right. So this is a one dimensional sample space and various events that I can talk about are let us say this the numeral 6 shows shows up when you throw a dice right. What is the event here? The event here is a sample single single sample point this is a single sample point event. right and typically an event will den denote by this notation this denotes a subset right a subset consisting of a single sample point. We could talk of the event that the uh, outcome is an even number that you see an even number of dots right. So it could be either 2 or 4 or 6. So the event could be that you see an even number of dots when you throw the die. <coughs> so the subset that we are talking now uh, talking about now are is this subset that you see either 2 or 4 or 6. This is a logical comp combination of uh, the sample points that you have. Now we could have a sure event. A sure event will always occur right. For example as I said in the case of uh, throwing of a die any one of the 6 numbers shows up right it is a sure event right. So it is all it is basically the complete sample space right. So uh, sure event is one which will always occur right? that is why we call it a sure event. Similarly we define a null event by this notation null or impossible event it will never occur both the sure event and the null event are subsets of the sample space right. Now having defined a probability uh, having defined a sample space omega and what else we are defined? We define the events right. Events all are all basically a combination of all possible subsets of the sample space omega right. Typically we call it a field denoted either by E or F right or class. So there is a sample space and there is a field. The sample space consisting of uh, consists of sample points and this field is actually an event space right and this field is the set of all possible subsets of omega right. 
the power set of omega in some sense. And having defined these two to complete our formal framework in which we can discuss probability, we define a probability system by three things, omega the field of events or the sample space of in the space of events and a probability measure p. So, this triplet omega the corresponding field of events and the probability measure p is called a probability system in our in which will which will provide us the framework for our studies. Okay. Sometimes it is also called a probability space, probability system or probability space. So, it consists of these three things. Basically, this last thing provides a ma mapping uh, from omega or from E to some real number, real positive numbers, right, which will essentially assign a probability measure to the occurrence of each event. So, P is a probability measure assigned to each event A in the field E. And this probability measure that you use to define this probability space should satisfy three axioms. These are very these are very important axioms. These are called the axioms of probability. The probability measure P that you assign the properties that you assign to various events must satisfy some properties. Right? These properties are first of all the probability of S the sure event is basically the same as probability of the sample space omega itself because the sure event is typically the sample space itself right. This is equal to 1 that is the first axiom. The second is this has to be for any event A this probability must be a number which lies between 0 and 1 and 3 if you consider the union of two events A and B which are disjoint events what are disjoint events A intersection B is null set. So, if, if A intersection B is null set then probability of A union B must be equal to probability of A plus probability of B right. If A intersection B is equal to the null set right. These three properties which any probability measure must satisfy constitute the basis of probability theory and these are called axioms of probability. Okay, that is three basic axioms of probability. Any questions so far? An implication of this is that for example, if you take your sample space omega whose uh, members were S1, S2, Sn etcetera right. Let us let us denote by P sub i the probability of S sub i right the probability measure of the ith event right. Then the implication of these axioms would be something like this. One implication would be that these will be all positive numbers the probability of each of these um, sample points or sample is, is greater than or equal to 0. The second implication would be that if I add up all these probabilities that is P1, P2, Pn this would be equal to 1 where i over all i such that Si belongs to the sample space right. And the third implication would be if I consider an event A which is basically consisting of a finite subset of these sample points right then the probability of this event will be the sum of these some of the properties of those sample points of which it is composed right. 
So, it is sim simply equal to sigma p i where i is chosen such that s sub i belongs to the event a and of course, a has to be a subset of omega right. I have just put in mathematical terms everything that we have discussed there is nothing really new here. So, in a way once this p i's are selected probabilities of all events get determined in as much as you can identify with every event a uh, the corresponding sample points which constitute the event a right. So, once uh, p i's are chosen uh, the probabilities of all events get fixed. In many many cases uh, this probability assignment that you do this probability measure that you choose uh, should follow uh, an appropriate model which is consistent with the physics of the situation right. So, the probability assignment usually has some model, but no matter how you choose it it must satisfy these axioms of probability right. Uh, and so, basically it should be related to the physics of the situation and therefore, in a way should reflect all the information that you have on the phenomenon that you are modeling. Of course, you cannot go by the precise physics because if you could work out the precise physics you did not have to take recourse to a random model right. The reason why we go for a random model is because it is difficult for us to work out the precise physics right that of course, one must understand, but whatever information is available this assignment should be consistent with that information right. For example, as an example suppose each of these p i s that I talked about in the previous slide suppose all these are e equal every sample every basic outcome has the same probability all outcomes have equal probability right. Then uh, suppose in a particular event a particular event is composed of a subset m of these outcomes then what can we say about the probability of these events the probability of that event it should be m upon n if all because all of them are equally likely. So, this is this is one possible model assume that all events are equally likely all basic outcomes are equally likely and then count the number of basic outcomes which constitute a particular event and this counting process itself determines the probability of that event right. So, I will not go further on this. Next we come to the concept of independent events. I am going through fast because I am assuming that you actually know all these things, but you require a very uh, brief and quick brush up. <coughs> Suppose we have two experiments, we perform two experiments. and the sample spaces associated with them are omega 1 and omega 2. And let us say the outcomes of if omega 1 uh, outcome of experiment 1 are S 1 prime to S m prime and omega 2 as S 1 double prime S 2 double prime etcetera. And let us say the probabilities associated with these outcomes are p sub i primes and the probabilities associated with these outcomes are p sub i double prime. Then we define a joint experiment these two sample spaces are the joint yeah these are um, they could be sometimes the same sample space as a special case right they could be, but we are talking of a very general situation. So, we call of a, uh, we talk about a joint experiment uh, omega whose outcomes are the joint 
combination the total aggregation of the two outcomes two sets of outcomes right. So, his out, 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 outcome consisting of such pairs S i prime S j double prime right that is experiment 1 produces S i prime and ex, experiment 2 produces S j double prime right. So, the basic outcomes now are these pairs all possible pairs. And now the description that we have discussed for the case of a single experiment will carry over to this joint experiment. Only thing is instead of working with simple probabilities we will work with what we will work with what are called joint probabilities right. The joint probability of experiment 1 producing S i prime and experiment 2 producing S j prime. It may so happen that the occurrence of the outcome from one experiment tells us gives us no information whatsoever about the out, outcome that will occur from the second experiment right. And that is occurrence of any one of these events has no bearing on the occurrence of the events from here. If that happens we say that <coughs> experiments omega 1 uh, experiments the two experiments are independent right. So, basically uh, first of all let us define a, uh, independent events we say that two events S i prime and S j double prime are independent if this joint probability the probability of this joint event is essentially P i prime and P j double prime it is the product of these two probabilities right. So, this is the definition this is independent events. actually I have defined in terms of the basic outcomes, but this could be replaced with events. In fact, we can talk about in independent events even in the same experiment right. We could have in the same experiment omega two events A 1 uh, let us say A 1 and A 2 both belonging to o omega both subsets of the same sample space. So, let me write it as both events defined in terms of omega and you could have a situation where the joint probability of A 1 and A 2 that is these two events occurring together the, the this is the product of the corresponding individual probabilities right. So, these are called independent events. These are not the same thing as ex exclusive events there is something called exclusive events. For example, if A 1 occurs A 2 will not occur right. In, incidentally you can uh, argue out that such exclusive events mutually exclusive events will not be independent right. They would have some kind of uh, uh, dependence, but independent events are those such that their joint probability is the product of the individual probabilities. If this happens for every possible pair of events across two experiments we say that the two experiments are independent statistically independent right. So, in that case these experiments themselves become uh, independent. So, we can also have independent experiments. Basically implies that every pair of events is statistically independent satisfies this property right. Then we, then we say that the corresponding experiments are statistically independent ok. So, that is a very quick review of ok one last uh, concept which I, I think I must mention before I go on to random variables the concept of conditional probability. We can also define probability of uh, a given uh, probability of the event A given that some other event B has occurred. You may have knowledge that a certain event has occurred and now you want to ask yourself given that that has occurred what is the probability of another event A 
right. Obviously, for this to be meaningful, typically A and B should have some relationship with each other, right. If they do not have a relationship, this uh, well, this we can still talk about it, but its value will be some, some fixed value, right. So, uh, this is called uh, this is a no typical notation probability of A given that B has occurred, right, given that the event B has occurred. So, probability of A, the event A given that B has occurred. Okay. It is it can be shown that one can write this probability in terms of the joint probability of the events A and B upon the probability of the event B. In fact, one can argue it out from basic fundamental principles. Again, since it is a review, I will not go into those, that kind of discussion, but it is very easy to see what is the implication if A and B are independent. What do you what do you see? This will be nothing but probability of A itself because if A and B are independent, this will be equal to P of A into P of B. P of B will get cancelled, and you will left with P of A. Basically, what you are saying is that if B gives no information about A, then basically it's nothing but probability of A itself, right? So, in general. What do you expect? P of A B, uh, A given B, to be less than P of A or more than P of A? Think about it. Hmm? Less than. Hmm? The this is in some sense a lower bound, right? If there is no, there is no. Uh, Basically, what you are hoping is that if there is a relationship between A and B, you get some more information about the occurrence of A and improve the a priori knowledge about A, uh, about the occurrence of A. So, hopefully, it should, it should improve the probability of A. So, uh, more about uh, inc incidentally, this relation is also called base formula, a um, base relationship between uh, the conditional probability and the joint probability right. Another way of defining the condition uh, joint probability therefore, is the conditional probability of A given B into probability of B. So, these are some very basic formulas that you should know. Okay. We next turn to random variables. So far when we discuss the probability space or the probability system that I defined, uh, our basic experiment could produce any kind of events, any kind of outcomes which could be descriptive or which could be numerical, right. For example, your uh, sample space could consist of descriptions like uh, heads and tails or some other similar non-numerical outcomes, right. And Obviously, when you are working with a mathematical model of things, it is much more convenient to work with things which are numerical in nature rather than non-numerical in nature, right. And that is the primary motivation for bringing up the concept of a random variable, right. A concept, if, you, if, if I define this as my sample space, if I denote this circle, um, let us say this circle denotes the sample space omega, right. That means, all the outcomes are points in omega. And the events in you know, events which are associated with omega would be subsets of this. So, sir, so suppose this is a subset of this. So, this would become an event in that probability space in that defined corresponding to this events uh, this sample space. Is it right? So, this is some event. Let me define it uh, denoted by B. Right. Now, basically, a random variable is a mapping. Right. So, if I say a random variable x 
it is a name that I give to a mapping which maps events in this sample space to corresponding subsets of the real line. So, it is a mapping from your original sample space omega to the real line. So, x is a mapping from omega to the real line r. Okay. So, all the points which constitute this event b right, they will typically get mapped to through this random variable x to a subset of the real line. Right. So, this event b will now be designated something like this on the real line. So, when I say the event b has occurred in the original sample space what we could equivalently say is that the random variable x has taken some values in this range on the real line. Okay. So, basically in this sense events here events in the original sample space get mapped to subsets of the real line instead of being subsets of omega here omega becomes equal to or omega gets mapped to the real line r the sample space omega gets mapped to the complete real line r right from minus infinity to infinity uh, to infinity and subsets of r become equivalent events that we can talk about and the and the mapping is given a name x and x we call is a random variable but remember there is nothing random about this mapping this mapping is unique a point to point mapping if this event occurs this will map to this interval if another event occurs it will map to some very fixed corresponding interval. So, there is nothing random about the mapping itself, but in as much as these events which occur are random and therefore, the range of values that you will see associated with this are random they become random and therefore, we call this a random variable right, but there is nothing absolutely nothing random about this mapping itself right. So, this is a rule random variable is a rule or a mapping to establish correspondence between sample points in omega and points on the real line. actually therefore, in, in the strict sense it is not really a variable at all right. It is a functional mapping right. It is a it is it is a function whose domain is this and whose range is this right. So, random variable is actually a function it is really a misnomer to call it a random variable and also there is nothing random about it. The reason why we call it random is because the things that we are mapping are random okay that is basically the point. Let me uh, illustrate this so that there is no confusion about it. Take a very small example, take the simplest possible example of tossing a coin whose outcomes are non numerical. So, your sample space omega here is h and t. Incidentally, what is the corresponding event space here? What is uh, E here? What is hmm? it will consist of the null set. Right, the impossible event, the sure event, the H and the T. The sure event is basically H union T right and the null event is basically H intersection T, intersection of H and T right, <coughs> neither H nor T occurs right. So, basically these are the four possible events you can talk about in this case. And suppose I now define a mapping like this. So, x is a mapping which maps the outcome h to the value 1 right. So, this is a mapping that I am defining arbitrarily right and it is x of x with the argument t is equal to 0. So, it is map h to 1 and t to 0. <coughs> now, Therefore, you can see that it is a function, it is a function whose domain is this and whose range is the real line right. So, 
it is x now can take only two possible values in this particular case namely 1 and 0. But I can still talk about events as subsets of the real line for example I can talk about the event that x the value of x is less than minus 5 although I will never have minus 5 here but I can talk about this event right. So it is a, it will be an example of a null event impossible event x less than or equal to minus 5 x less than or equal to 2 becomes a sure event because the two values that I have assigned to h and t will be will be contained in this interval x less than or equal to 2 will be a sure event right and so on and so forth. Let me let me take one more example suppose an urn contains three balls a white one a blue one and a red one. And let us say you choose a ball at random that is the experiment. So your sample space here is you will see either this or this or this these are the three sample points that you can have. <coughs> right. So let me define the random variable x to be like this let us say it will take the value pi if s is equal to w or b right it will take the value 0 if s is equal to r. <coughs> this is another possible mapping right. So once again x becomes a binary valued random variable. So I can define any kind of mapping and that becomes a random variable for different definitions of the mapping I will have different random variables for the same sample space and for the same experiment okay. I can define many different random variables on the same omega all it, it takes is define a different mapping to do that. Okay. Having defined a mapping <coughs> which we call the random variable, so is the concept of a random variable clear? We now define a probability measure which helps it, which makes it very easy for us to work with <coughs> the new domain that we have created, the new range in which the random variable works, namely the real line. So when we talk about probabilities now, instead of talking about probabilities in the original <coughs> sample space omega it is much more meaningful to talk about probabilities in the new sample space which is a real line right and a probability measure which makes it very easy for us to specify the probabilities on the real line is a probability distribution function. Before I go into this please understand that not all in, in, not, in, not in all situations you need to create such a mapping in many situations this mapping is implicit in the experiment itself you are measuring something numerically right and the outcome is random. So you already have some kind of a mapping which is implicit in the experimentation process which you do not have to explicitly define there okay. So that is something that you must understand that is part of this formulation part of this framework in which we are working okay. So we let me come back to probability distribution function since it is rather awkward to uh, write the probability of every single event that is every possible point on the real line that is what we will need to do otherwise uh, is not it we'll, if you want to define <coughs> the probability of various events on the real line now you will have to define the probability of every possible interval every possible point on the real line right and that will be that will become so awkward so difficult to do for every point or subset of R it is convenient to introduce a point wise function which is called the probability distribution function. So it is convenient to 
introduce a pointwise probability function which we call the probability distribution function. Right? I'll denote it by capital P, capital D, capital F, uh, which stands for probability distribution function. It's a pointwise probability function in the sense that it is defined for every point in the real line, right? In a particular way, but it is defined in such a manner that given this probability function, I can write the probability of any point uh, of probability of the random variable x taking any particular value. Right? Once I know this function, I can. So this this awkwardness goes. It becomes a very simple framework. The formal definition is probability uh, distribution function is defined as the probability of the random variable x taking a value less than or equal to some numerical value small x. Please remember in this notation this capital X is the name of the random variable right and the small x that I am using is defining a numerical range over which it taking is this this random variable is this mapping is taking the values right. I could as well have said x taking the value less than or equal to y it would not make any difference because this small x and this small y is just some numerical value that I have selected right. So this is equal to the probability that x lies in the interval from minus infinity to small x right which is essentially saying that if this is your real line and this is a point x right we are talking about the probability that x lies in this interval. This is many times denoted by p sub x of x in some books you will find f sub x of x the typical notation for the probability distribution function right. In this notation the subscript x indicates the name of the random variable and small x denotes the numerical value which about which you are talking which specifies the range from minus infinity to that value. It is probably sounding very elementary to some of you because you some of you have done this course uh, but nevertheless let us quickly brush through. So this is uh, this is what we this is the what is called the probability distribution function sometimes we just denote this x uh, the subscript x when it is clear which random variable we are talking about. We may be talking about two different random variables x and y let us say right. In that case please remember this this two distribution functions although I am using the same notation p the fact that their subscripts are different will be two different functions altogether they are not the same functions right. So the functional differentiation now comes through the subscript because this is the probability distribution function associated with x this is the distribution function associated with y both are being considered at function functions of some variable x. So small x is actually the variable the val variable which takes on numerical values right capital X and capital Y are the names of this random variable. Now the distribution function will have some properties which are derived from which are a result of the basic axioms of probability right. So there are some basic properties associated with the distribution function. Here I am at the moment denoting uh, dropping the subscript x capital X because I am not dealing with different variables. <coughs> One is that for every value of small x the value of this probability the value of this will be between 0 and 1. Basically what does it denote this denotes some event on the real line right and we already seen that every event will have a positive probability according to the axioms of probability. So this really follows from the axioms one of the axioms of probability. Then what can we say about this this corresponds to the impossible event that x is less than or equal to minus infinity right it is not possible according to the way we define this. So this is the impossible event its probability must be 0 similarly the probability associated the, the distribution function value associated with x equal to infinity would be equal to 1 corresponding to the sure event and 
third p of x is always a non decreasing function which is quite quite obvious from the definition right because if i consider two values one less than this another value less than this then obviously this event this event will with the union of this event and this event and the probability of this therefore would be the probability of this plus the probability of this it can never be less than the probability of this right even if this is a null event this can happen that this is a null event but in that case also the probability of this event will be at both at, at least this much so it can never decrease as small x increases right so it's a non decreasing function of x and last the probability that x lies in some finite interval x1 it should be strictly less than and x2 is equal to this is i think quite obvious so i will not prove it you can prove it yourself is a value of the distribution function at x2 minus the value of the distribution function at x1 right no it makes a difference because by definition the point x2 is included in um, here we are doing a general treatment it, this is supposed to be valid for both continuous as well as discrete random variables okay let me uh, consider some typical distribution functions if i take into account these properties that we just just discussed based on this you can have various kinds of distribution functions but one thing is sure that every distribution function p of x if this is uh, I am plotting it against the variable small x right it will start from 0 on the extreme left hand side right somewhere on the extreme left hand I mean somewhere it could be extreme left hand side or beyond that and cannot exceed 1 it has to, it is a mapping which lie be, lies between 0 and 1 right that is one thing that is clear second is it is a non decreasing function so typical curve could be like that can never be less than 0 it cannot be more than 1 it has to be non decreasing right another situation could be like this here I am going from minus infinity this is actually denotes a continuous random variable whose values lie between minus infinity and plus infinity right. I could have a continuous random variable whose values lie in a finite interval let us say from A to B right. So, it is 0 for and goes up to b right it can never decrease of course i hope this is not this is a non decreasing function once again right i could also have so this is a continuous random variable with values between on a finite interval a to b you could have a third kind of situation where p of x is something like this it, right it is 0 up from up to here becomes some finite value here so some other finite value here and so on and so forth but cannot exceed 1 right this is the case of a discrete random variable because basically what it means is that it can take these values which are 
denoted by A, B, C, etc. here. This is a discrete. This is an example of a discrete random variable with four possible values, namely the value zero, the value a, the value b, and the value c. Okay. So, does this make sense? The last example, basically, for example, if this is the only four values it can take, and I ask the question, what is the probability that x lies? between x lies between x is less than or equal to um, a. So, let us say I put strictly x less than or equal to x less than a, it will be nothing but the probability that x is equal to 0 right. So, it, it will be constant between 0 to a right because between 0 to a it cannot take any values right. So, but if I say probability x is less than or equal to a. then it includes this probability also because probability that x is equal to a is this much right. So, that because in the discrete case this discontinuity means that the point x equal to a has a finite probability. In a continuous random variable if I ask the question what is the probability that probability that x is equal to a the answer would be 0 right. What is the probability that x lies in a finite interval? I can compute from the distribution function right. For a continuous random variable it will be p x minus p x it will, it will be equal to 0 right and so on and so forth okay. Now, uh, I can go on but uh, let me just uh, close on a related concept of a probability density function. It is more convenient to work with it is denoted by small p of x and is defined as a derivative of the distribution function. Let me just um, okay I think I will start from here next time, but uh, what I it will be nice if you can now quickly review as much of probability theory as you can from uh, any book which you have access to. Uh, it is given in uh, Lattice book the review you could read Lattice book or you could read uh, Hakin's book the older edition and if you can do that then it will be easy for me to it will be more meaningful that we complete this review very quickly in the class. Thank you very much. Thank you.